When I say it's a privilege to be able to do this, I mean it's a privilege. Next Sunday will mark the one-year anniversary that my folks and I came from fellowship to visit. And let me just be honest, you guys have been an amazing blessing. You guys have been wonderful. You have received us with love and care. And the, the way that our merger happened and the way that everything went down, I could not be more thankful to the Lord for how that happened. So I just want to say thank you. Our text tonight is going to be 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever felt like you there was a passage of Scripture that you were reading at a particular time that you felt like you were living in? Whether it would be Proverbs 3, 4, 5, and 6, or another, one, another a psalm perhaps where there was anguish being poured out and there was your heart that was just aching before God. For me, it would be this text where Paul is talking about thorns and he's talking about boasting in weaknesses. Because I don't know about you, but if you made a list of what you brag in and of what you boast in, I would venture to say that your weaknesses would not be up at the top. When I, If I were to make a list of the things that I am good at, running would certainly not be up at the top. I would leave that to Mr. John McDonald and the evidence by my fourth grade field day and tripping over every hurdle. Um, we hate our weaknesses. We hate what impedes our progress. We hate and loathe what we wish was not there. And so when we come to this text tonight, I just want you to remember that we're talking about the Apostle Paul. <laughs> we're talking about one who was close to God, who got an incredible vision and an incredible revelation. And because of that, he was given something that he wished was taken away. And we'll see what God's response is in just a moment. But just for time's sake, we're going to... I'm going to jump right in, and we're just going to be going through verses 1 through 10 as we go. Like I said, we live in a culture today that very much values superlatives and extremes. Who is the fastest? Who is the strongest? Who, is, who earns the most money? Who is the most famous? It doesn't take long to turn on the television set. and it's, It always amazes me what people will do for a chance to become famous. It doesn't matter what it is. They can be famous for singing, they can be famous for anything, and they will sacrifice their dignity and anything to get there. We're just fresh off of the Olympics. Any Olympic fans? So it's like the three of us. Uh, so uh, somebody trains their entire life for a moment of glory, and then, like a comedian said, the difference between success and failure is here, here. You know, first place here, second place back here. Anyway, and also, compet there's competitions all the time, like the world's strongest man in the Arnold Classic that pit people against each other to see if they're the strongest, the most fit, or if they have the most skill at any given activity. And just in case you're wondering, I've never attended any of those events myself, mainly because I didn't want to embarrass anyone or show anyone up, of course. Um, but in all seriousness, really, we live in a world and a culture that is constantly pushing a value system on us that we need to be strong, that we need to move quickly and be the best, that we need to cram as much into a given day as humanly possible. And at the end of the day, the dollar signs better reflect that. And according to the world, if you're unhappy in any way, it's because you haven't pushed yourself hard enough, put in enough reps at the gym, or sacrifice enough family time for your career to get that big promotion that, of course, you deserve. To put it another way, and quite simply, the world esteems and honors the strong and gives no accolades or trophies to the weak. In fact, to the world, the weak are seen as often an inconvenience 
period, as evidenced by the sentiments expressed by a famous old movie star, and if any of you recognize her, then my dad laughing at me for using this will be in vain, uh, Betty Davis, who I'm sure everyone, oh, everyone's heard of, um, she had an autobiography, but what was interesting is that she wrote this, the weak are the most treacherous of us all. They come to the strong and drain them. They are bottomless. They are insatiable. They are always parched and always bitter. They are everyone's concern. And, vam and like vampires, they suck our life's blood. Really, it doesn't take much, guys, to look around. And there's the fast lane. There's the people who climb the corporate ladder. And if you're weak in any way, shape, or form, you're going to get brushed to the side. You're going to get forgotten. And only the strong survive, as that phrase has been often said. And I'm sure that if we stretched our minds really, really hard, we could think of at least one, maybe two persons that we know who love to boast on themselves. Sometimes those people can be hard to be around. And there's reason for that. They are full of themselves. Well, that kind of brings us to our text tonight. Remember, a little bit of background about 2 Corinthians is that Paul is having to defend himself against, quote, these super apostles, these guys who, who are polished, they are, they are slick, they are professionals, and they are accusing the apostle Paul at being inferior because of all of the sufferings, of all of the beatings, of all of the things that from an external physical perspective would make you look and be like, who is this guy? Remember, physically, he wasn't that impressive. He probably had trouble with his eyes. He had difficulty with, un with his speech. He wasn't polished in the, re in the rhetoric of the Greeks that they considered valuable and that they were impressed by. So what's interesting is that as we come to our text tonight in verse 1, we see the Apostle Paul doing something that really kind of seems out of place for him. Isn't this the same guy that said, I am the least of all of the apostles? So why do we come to verse 1, and what's the first thing that we see? He says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. What kind of boasting is he talking about? He is having to boast in things that actually matter. In things such as, we're not going to read it all, but in back in chapter 11, there's three categories that he boasts in. His Jewish lineage, his apostolic trials that he goes through, which if you're having a bad day, look at the end of chapter 11, and that was a Tuesday for the Apostle Paul. But here in chapter 12, we get to an incredible section that is the third category that he is mentioning, that of all of the things that qualify him to be a, an, an apostle and a reason that the church at Corinth should listen to him is because he has this incredible vision and revelation from God. And what's interesting, I heard a pastor say one day, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but you can imagine that God gives him this thorn for a reason because if they're sitting around the table, if they're sitting around looking and they're coming up with decision making for the church, this would be a pretty weighty one to drop. How many trips have you had to heaven? We'll do it my way. But because of this, we're going to see that God graciously, and that's the point that I want all of us to remember, that he graciously gives him something that immediately Paul does not want. But let's keep going. So in verse 1, he's boasting. What we're going to see here in verses 1 through 10 is an experience that he has. Just keep this in mind. Especially the first few verses he's talking about, he's getting a vision and a revelation. He says in verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. The first thing that we can see is that this revelation does not take place where? Here. He is getting what? He's getting caught up to somewhere different. Now, some people have wondered if this was, if this was at all associated with his road to Damascus vision. Because remember, in the road to Damascus, he saw Christ. He saw the Lord. There was an experience. Uh, there was a, there was an experience there. But of course, we know that that's not the case for a couple of reasons. One is the date. 
Second Corinthians was probably written around 55 A.D. The experience that, so if, if we subtract 14 years, that's what, 41 A.D. that he's talking about? His conversion was probably, I'm, I don't have a mic on, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'll, I'll do this. His conversion was probably around 36 A.D., they say. So it wasn't that, it wasn't, it doesn't line up timetable wise. And also, the language here is one of what? He's getting caught up. He's going up. It's not happening here on earth. It's very dissimilar than what happened on the road to Damascus incident. He's getting caught up. What's interesting is that it's the same phrase that is used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 where it says that we who are alive and remain will be what? Caught up to meet the Lord in the air and thus will always be with the Lord. Verse 4. So basically, he's getting this vision and he doesn't know if it's in the body or out of the body, but how does he end that section? With the most important, critical, crucial part, the fact that it's not important whether or not he knows. Who knows? Anyone? God. It doesn't matter if he knows. He knows that God knows, and he relegates it, and he leaves it in that category. So, what's interesting, and I haven't mentioned this to this point is that from verses about 1 to 6 he is talking almost outside of himself like he's talking about himself in the third person which leads some to believe or question whether or not this is actually Paul well this is definitely Paul and we know that by the time we get down to verse 7 he uses language where he'll identify himself particularly and definitively and say lest I become conceited X so just to let you know, there's almost some semantical linguistic gymnastics that Paul is kind of doing, talking about boasting in one category and boasting in another sense. But with that in mind, look what happens. He gets caught up and he sees things incredible, which is usually the case when someone gets a vision of God, right? Isaiah 6, which John McDonald will preach on in a number of weeks, Isaiah saw something amazing. He saw God. If... <laughs> Anytime anyone ever claims if you're turning the, if you're flipping the TV around and there's some preacher saying, you know what, I was shaving and I heard God, which you'll hear. And then he and I had a conversation. Just turn the TV off. You can throw the remote if you want. But the guy's a kook. Because anytime anyone legitimately gets an, ex an experience of God, they're petrified. They're terrified. And what's incredible here is that Paul, so what we have, Paul gets what? Snatched up and he's instantly placed where? He says the third heaven. Now there's a couple, there's three different spheres that we know about that Jewish literature talks about and just biblical literature in general. The first heavens is what? What's around us, the firmament and everything that we see, the sky. The second heavens is the universe, the galaxies, the planets, the stars. And then the third heaven would be considered God's domain. It would be considered God's domain also where the angels would reside as well. But verse 4, he says that he gets up there, and what does it say? And he heard, he's still kind of using that language about this guy getting caught up, so he's still saying he, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. This is incredible. Whatever he sees, whatever he is participating in, there is a strict prohibition for what? Him not to repeat it. In other words, it's for his ears only. And I remember hearing a pastor talk about that. Isn't that so kind and gracious and merciful of the Lord? Good heavens. Look what Paul had been going through in just the previous chapter when he's, list when he's listing his shipwrecks, his beatings. The man had to have been discouraged. So God in his mercy and in his grace lifts him up. Who knows what he said? Who knows what he saw? But it was something to encourage him, to give him hope. But when he puts him, but when he puts him back, there's an incredible thing that we're going to get to in just a minute. So he heard things that cannot be uttered. It cannot be repeated. Look at verse 5. He's kind of coming around. He's kind of talking about now he's, he's moving the language a little bit to say that on behalf of this man... I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. This kind of goes back to what I was talking about. <laughs> if you went into a job interview and you had 
quote, what I would call a resume of rejections and insults and ways that you had failed. That's probably not the way that you would go in and expect to land the job, to land the gig. Yet that's exactly what we see the Apostle Paul doing here in his defense, in the way that he wants to defend himself against these super apostles who are once again the polished individuals. He says, you know what, I'm not going to play your game. I'm going to follow the pattern of Christ and I'm going to be humble and I'm going to boast. If I boast in anything, like we know in Galatians 6.14, I'm going to boast in the cross of Christ. If I'm going to boast in anything, I'm going to boast in how weak I am so that Christ may be glorified as he's going to get to eventually here at the end of this chapter. But he says, I will, I'm not going to boast. I'm not going to play your game except with my weaknesses. Then he says in verse 6, Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears in me. If he were to boast, it would have been absolutely legitimate. Once again, because look, you talk about commitment, faithfulness, the things like he says in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, what does God count? What does he want in a steward but one that is found faithful? Paul could have legitimately held out the genuine characteristics of the Christian life and been an absolute model. We know that he did this in other parts of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. But he's not going to play their game particularly. He's only giving us this example of this third category. And for our purposes, as we're looking through this, the most exciting part for me is coming up in verses 7 through 10. So up to this point, remember, three categories, right? He boasted at the end of 11. Now, and just, to, just for reference, it, it was 11 verse 5 where he calls them, quote, super apostles. Um, but at the end of 11, he's talking about their Jew, his Jewishness, his apostolic trials, and this vision once again that he saw something amazing. But in verse 7, because God showed him something that was absolutely incredible and beyond belief, he says in verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. I don't think Paul saw that coming. I think that he was surprised, shocked, hurt, perhaps. Whatever it was, whatever this thorn was, it affected him greatly. There's the word for this for, for the thorn is is a, there's there's a little bit of ambiguity. It can mean anything from a fish hook, a splinter, a thorn, to an actual stake that is rammed through. It's something that is very pointed, something that would have affected Paul greatly. But I think the thing that we have to see about this thorn is that if he, no matter what way we interpret it, he was always aware of it. He was, it would be just like if you had something that was sticking through your hand that you wished wasn't there, of course, and it couldn't come out. And no matter what you did, you were constantly aware of it. Just remember, too, just on a side note, we are all always in danger of becoming conceited. I think other translations talk about lest I be puffed up. In our Christian life, the greatest enemy that we have is not the devil. It's not the world. Who's the greatest enemy that we usually face? It's the man or woman in the mirror. It's the, it's the syndrome about Romans 7 where I constantly do that which I don't want to do and vice versa. We are constantly in danger of, in, of being full of ourselves. The point, like I said, was that he was constantly aware of this thorn. And why was it? It was because the, the revelation was so great. And who gave him the thorn? God. And what was the form that that took? It says it was a messenger of Satan. Like a, There's a, a few possible interpretations with that. 
Some think it, it could have been his eyes, once again, because of the reference to Galatians 4.15, that he knew the Galatians would have even gouged out their own eyes to give to him. Some see it as straight demon oppression, that it was a demon who was constantly attacking him, constantly going and whispering whatever or however he would have interacted with Paul. Others still think that, there, that perhaps it was these, these super apostles that were constantly opposing everything that Paul did and were trying to tear him down, whatever it was. Once again, with the thorn, we're, there's just not, evident, there's not enough evidence to declare specifically what it was. But like I said, the emphasis for me is not what it could have been, but how it affected him. He was always aware of it. And the one thing that it did, just like it would have for any of us, if, you're, if, if you have something over here and you're looking that way initially, can you focus and gaze be in two different places at once? No. So if you're constantly doing this, whatever this thorn was, he would have begged, and he does here in just a moment, he would have pleaded with God to take it away. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have anything like that in your life? Is there one area that takes your gaze off of the Lord and frustrates you to no end? Is there one spot where you scream out to God, Lord, if you would just take this one thing away, or if this one category could be different, my life would be good. If I could just find that mate, if I could just get that one job and that one promotion that I deserve, if I just didn't have this illness, Lord, if I... Dot, dot, dot. Never forget, folks, that the enemy is the master of what? Distraction. And as far he is, he is so skillful at getting our eyes off of him and in turn putting us in a place of discouragement when, we had, when he has done so. You might have heard this little story. I'm going to read really quick. I better start moving. I won't run because I can't do that. Thank you. Um, this, this little story I've, I've had for a while, but it, it, it says, it was advertised that the devil was going to put his tools up for sale. On the date of the sale, the tools were placed for public inspection, each tool being marked with its sale price. They were a treacherous lot of implements, hatred, envy, jealousy, deceit, lying, pride, and so on. Laid apart from the rest was a harmless-looking tool that appeared to have been heavily used and was priced very high. What's the name of this tool? Asked one of the purchasers, pointing to it. Oh, that's discouragement, said the devil. Why have you priced it so high? Because it is more useful to me than all of the others. I can pry open and get inside people's hearts with it when I cannot get near them with my other tools. Once I get inside, I can make them do what I choose. It is badly worn because I use it on almost everyone, since very few people know that it belongs to me. Just a, an anecdotal story about, we don't often think about discouragement or we can just think it's normal, but just remember that there's a reason he is called the enemy of our souls. He is slick. He is skillful. He knows you. He has been around for a lot longer than you have, no matter what your age. And he knows human nature. He knows how to get to you, particularly through this. So in verse 7, we saw that he, in order that he wouldn't be conceited, God gave him this thorn. What is Paul's response? I would venture to say that it's pretty similar to what yours would be, and I know it's similar to what mine would be. What does it say in verse 8? Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. For me, guys, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This is where you can have two paths. You find yourself in an uncomfortable situation. You can either do one, number one, you can res be resentful and bitter and reject God because of the trials that he is putting you. If you see it through him, if you see it as it's from him, or the other path is to wait on his response, regardless of if it is the one we want to hear. And that is the part that is tough for us. Because if I am used to anything, I am used to getting 
my meal in two minutes or less. I am used to getting an answer now. I am used to getting an answer that I like and that is comfortable. But nothing about this is comfortable. Nothing about this is predictable. My dad told me a great quote recently, that God is faithful, but he's unpredictable. And doesn't, doesn't that prove true in your life and in mine? That you talk about a roller coaster ride up one side and down the other, month after month after year, I would say that each one of us could go around this room and say, I never could have imagined that this would have happened to me. But you know what? God is faithful. He has brought me through, and I am trusting him more now than before I went through this. So first of all, we have to say that Paul is correct and right in praying this prayer, in pleading before God, because what does God always want us to do? To come before him and bring our true heart. He wants true worship. What did he say in the Old Testament? Mercy and sacrifice I want. You can take your, or mercy and sacrifice I don't, I don't care for. I want repentance. I want your true heart. It's always been a matter of the heart. If you talk to someone and they draw a distinct dividing line between the Old Testament and the New and say God was a God of law and a, he was a wrathful God. But in the, in the New Testament, he is a God of love and of mercy. It couldn't be, more for, it couldn't be further from the truth. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the God, our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Matthew 22, obviously, the Lord repeats that. God is merciful. He longs to bring his people back over and over and over in the Old Testament. Then. And what do they do? They reject him. So Paul is right to pray because that's honestly what is on our heart, what is on his heart. He goes before God. He pleads that God would take this away. What's incredible to me, and I thought about this yesterday as I was helping at the garden, not to plug that in. Um, even our Lord, as incredible a thought as this is to me, when he was in the Mount of Olives in Luke 22 and he was praying, it says, Luke uses the word agony. He was in agony praying to the Father, oh, Father, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. But how did he finish that prayer? As a model for you and as a model for me. Not my will, but yours be done. That's ultimately what we're getting here. That's what we're getting at here. With our prayers, Lord, as difficult as this is for me to stomach, not my will, but your will be done. Well, this brings us to verse 9, which... Okay, we're doing all right. I promise I'll move quickly. Verse 9. Now we get to what? This is amazing because it does not matter that Paul is the chosen apostle to the Gentiles. It does not matter that Paul is going to be used to write a good portion of Scripture. It does not matter that Paul has gone down through the ages as as one of the chief people associated with Christianity. What is the answer that he gets? Well, simply, no. Paul, I'm not going to take this thorn from you. You just have to imagine Paul. He gets this revelation. He goes. He sees things incredible. He comes back. He has this thorn that's put on him, in him, whatever it is. He pleads with God three times, like the text says, take it away. And God says, no, I'm not going to take it away. Once again, I don't know what Paul's response was, but I know mine would have been, why, Lord? Why? What is the purpose of this? I don't understand. But it, this is the key. Instead of removing the thorn from Paul, God does what? He says, I will give you the grace to endure it. I will give you the grace to endure it. Remember, guys, everything in the Christian life is grace. We are saved by grace. We are kept, one day, we are kept by grace. And one day, we will see him face to face by what? Grace. I hate to break it to you, in case you were having a good day, but none of you at all deserve God's grace. God's mercy. 
Do you remember how it's described in the scriptures? How it's described in the New Testament? It's a gift. It's a gift. And so I know that the Lord has done a certain work with certain things in my heart to remind me of that. I pray as uncomfortable and as inconvenient as it can be that he's working that in your heart and that in your life. But it's all grace. We treasure grace. We love grace. John MacArthur has an interesting definition of grace and one that is extremely helpful. Now, hang with me for just a little bit longer. I know this is a long quote, but please focus on it because it is at the heart of what we're talking about in our text and about our God's heart toward us. He says this about grace. Grace is a magnificent word. It's used 155 times in the New Testament. It's ubiquitous all throughout the New Testament. Obviously, it needs to be because everything we have received from God is by grace. And all that we have received collectively is a complex of gracious gifts. The word grace in the Greek language is charis. It basically means a favor bestowed on a person who didn't earn it or didn't deserve it. It is a kindness that is unmerited. And in terms of how grace is used in the New Testament, it is God's divine favor on those who deserve wrath. Like Pastor Dave was talking about this morning, as terrifying an image as that is, that is absolutely where each one of us deserve to be. It is only by the mercy and grace of God that we are not. He goes on to say, It is God's divine favor on those who deserve wrath or judgment. That is the essential reality of our salvation. All of it is divine favor, a complex of divine favors granted to those of us who deserve wrath and judgment. Undeserved generosity from God. A couple more lines. This is where I think it, he really hits the nail on the head. But grace is not just an inner sort of concept. It is a force. It is a power. It is a power that transforms us. It's a power that awakens us from sleep. It is a power that gives us life in the midst of death. It is a power that is dynamic enough to transform us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son. It is the power that saves us. It is the power that keeps us. The power that enables us. The power that sanctifies us. And the power that one day will glorify us. You have to look at grace as a force. A divine force that God pours out into the lives of his people at all points to grant them all that they need to be for all that he desires. End quote. <laughs> um, I love what he talks about grace as a force. What's the end result for each one of us in the sanctuary? It's to be conformed into the image of his son. And I can tell you what, that's not going to happen on this earth. It's going to happen in glory. It's going to happen in heaven. And once again, when you look back at your life, at all the different stops and at all the different points, what has been the wind behind your back? What has been pushing you along has not been you. I hate to tell you, it's been grace. Because the end goal is this finish line that he has in mind for each one of us. And the grace that he gives and that he, for, in my instance, floods me with is everything that I need to get me to that final destination. But one quick question. Why is, the, why is it necessary for Paul to get grace and to go through it and simply not to have God remove this thorn from him? Well, here's the answer. And if you've zoned out until now, please listen. Because this is the crux of the whole matter. The reason God does this is because of the sinful propensity and capacity of Paul's heart. Just like yours and just like mine. God is taking Paul through this to protect Paul from distancing himself from the Lord like we all would do because of pride. Instead of removing the thorn, he gives Paul the grace to endure it. In doing so, he lets Paul cultivate the chief of Christian virtues, 
humility while still bringing him through the other side. Like I said, God is not going to abandon us. God is not going to leave us on our own. He is with us and he gives us the grace that we need. Because don't forget, since the fall, we're twisted, distorted images of our former selves. And because of that, we think we're far better off than we are. And ultimately, that we don't need God's forgiveness in our lives or his grace. And remember that the whole reason the Pharisees hated Christ so much, other than the fact that he constantly exposed that their deeds were wicked and that their deeds were phony and fake, was that he was the embodiment of grace, which was a slap in the face to their works-based religion. Remember what John said about the Lord in the Gospel of John 1.14? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Jesus Christ was and still is, of course, the embodiment of grace, and they hated him for it. So much so that after his first sermon, they wanted to destroy him. Oh, brother and sister, I pray that that is never us. I pray that we see daily our need for his constant grace being infused in our lives and that we're thankful for it. That, we're not, we, that we don't wish merely that the thorn didn't exist, but that we can cherish it because he's giving me the grace that I need to get through it. Isn't this the gospel? Romans 5 eight. but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's the million dollar question. Whose righteousness are you counting on to get into heaven? I hope it's not your own. I hope it's nothing that, you're, that you do. Teaching Sunday school, reading your Bible, praying, do all, doing all of these things is great, but it merits no salvation. It merits no salvation. Righteousness, justification, all of those wonderful terms that we hold so dear only come through grace and through Christ. It's all grace. With this in mind, we see Paul's response. He's oh so thankful for the grace and really never got over how merciful and compassionate God has been to him. He then goes on to say, since it is through weakness that Christ's power is made manifest to the world, he welcomes it. You know what? I'm even going to boast in it. And he makes mention at the end of verse 9 that I will, he says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may what? Rest upon me. The weaker I am, seemingly, the more that I get out of the way, the more that Christ can infuse his spirit in me. I suppose, and I'm very quickly closing, I promise, because the seven o'clock chime is right around the corner. I suppose if I had to give this sermon a title, it would be trusting him in the white water. Because that's exactly what we see happening here. Amidst Paul being in a situation that he finds incredibly uncomfortable and that creates tumultuous waves in his life because of it, he trusts God. It's almost like he's standing there and there's two jet engines on either side just noise and everything that he could not possibly understand and yet he it does not affect his gaze he continues to look up to the savior that's the point all of us must get to we're so used to comfort especially here in america that anything that infringes on it we see as needing to get rid of immediately i know i've had things like that and i'm sure that you have as well for me, it was finding myself in a doctor's office getting a basic heart medicine that simply blocks adrenaline effects in the body, or what's called a beta blocker, for what had become the onset of panic attacks and anxiety, where my body seemed to rage against me for doing what I loved, ironically getting up and speaking in front of people like I'm doing right now. While I'm still working through the situation and taking the medication to this day, I'm beginning, I'll say beginning, 
to get the view and sentiments that Paul has here, instead of hating my weakness, which I can tell you that I have for so long, I'm starting to glory in it because of how he has worked in my heart because of it. My pride would have been off the charts, guys. But because he has brought me low with certain things, I am so thankful for it. That's the point, brothers and sisters. The weaker we are and more honest we are with our weakness among the body, the more praise and honor and glory he gets when marvelous things occur. Why? Because it's obviously not because of us that they're happening, but because of him. Last page. Mm -hmm. A simple resume of who God has chosen reminds us of that. Moses, who in Exodus 3 pleaded with God, God, pick anybody else. I can't talk. I can't do anything. I will, I will do anything else, but don't make me the chosen one to lead your people out of Egypt. Peter, who buckled under a girl just asking him if he even knew the Lord and denying the Lord three times. And then, of course, you and me. So in conclusion, don't get discouraged with your weaknesses. Don't let the enemy whisper in your ear doubts about his love for you. His love is unfading and unchanging toward his elect. I'm going to read a couple quick passages. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. That's the whole point, guys. That if anything, he wants to get your eyes off of Christ and cause you to begin to doubt God's love for you. Everything has been repackaged. Since the beginning, since he whispered in Eve's ear, did God really say? In other words, does God really have your best interest at heart by doing this? He's repackaged it a million times over. Don't be distracted. God's heart toward us is unchanging. Psalm 103, 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Nor as, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And I would venture to say you know this verse. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And remember that no matter what you're going through, it's ultimately temporary. No matter how heavy something seems in this life, no matter how unbearable or the point of despair might come close to you, no matter how bad that is, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 earlier in this book, verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us what? An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Because I guarantee you one thing. As soon as Paul left this world and he was looking at his Savior, that thorn didn't mean anything. It was instantly forgotten in the light of Christ. But remember, some things might be around our whole life. There are certain actions and decisions that we can make that consequences can be around. I think of the movie A Beautiful Mind, if you've ever seen it, where John Nash, this brilliant man, had these apparitions that he had been seeing early on in the movie and early on in his life. And at the end of the movie, what? They're still there. There might be things that we've done or just certain conditions that might not get fixed, but you know what we can do? We can trust God. The final verse, he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, he says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The key phrase for us when we look at that is, For the sake of Christ. For God's glory, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, however that comes, keeping in mind that he is working all things out for his glory in our good. And we are, remember, guys, assured that however, no matter what we're going through, one day every wrong will be made right. When Aslan comes in sight, as C.S. Lewis so eloquently put it, 
when writing about a character that symbolized the Lord. And I'm going to close with three passages. You don't have to turn there. But if we're going to talk about boasting, the Lord has something to talk to say about that in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 9, just two verses, 20, 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Hebrews 12, if we're talking about fixing our gaze somewhere, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And final thing, if we're talking about conclusions and end of the race and where God wants to get each one of us, how can we not finish with Jude 24 and 25? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful for your grace. We are so thankful for all of the things that you put us through that we would, on our own, never choose to go through. All of the thorns, all of the situations, all of the heartache, all of the misery, we glory in it because Christ gets the praise. We thank you for it, Lord. We just pray for the grace to endure it. We are so thankful that on our behalf you sent your Son that you sent him to be our propitiation on the cross. We love you and we love your grace. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.